Hello everybody, welcome along to this video. This is Mr. Johnson Teaches Checking Out Me History Revision. Part of the series of videos I've done covering all 15 of the poems from the Power and Conflict cluster. And if you're watching this video, I'm presuming that's the cluster that you're studying, in which case you'll find it on your GCSE English Literature Paper 2. And it's Section B on that paper. And as a reminder, that is where the exam board will print one of the poems and attached to it will be a question about the poem. And it's up to you to then choose a second poem which compares with it in your opinion. Um, so it might be Checking Out My History as the named poem, it might be the one that you choose. Uh, either way, it's definitely a really good one um, because it's very different from a lot of the other poems in there, both in what it's talking about and also the sort of tone and how it deals with it. Be ready to pause this video. When you see the pause symbol there, that's a hint that you want to be pausing it and it's absolutely imperative, really, really important that you are pausing this video and making notes, uh, your own notes, ideally on your anthology page. Um, so before we get going too far then, make sure you've got a copy of the poem in front of you so you can actually complete this revision. Um, it might be you have to print one off the internet. If you search for Agard, checking out my history, you'll find that one will come up pretty quickly there. Uh, or ideally if you've got your own anthology to hand, even better. Either way, pause this and get yourself ready now please. And then I will talk on about one thing, and it's identity. When we're reading and exploring this poem, keep the idea of identity in mind and what makes us who we are. And part of that is what we are taught about ourselves, and education plays a massive part in that. This is absolutely a poem which is sort of centred around the idea of education, but then also asking questions about, is that education broad enough? And we'll see more about that shortly. So, what I want you to do now quickly then is pause this video that you're watching right now and just read through the poem to yourself, reminding yourself of it. Take a couple minutes, but do it properly for me, and then I'll be waiting on the other side of that little pause. So, pause now. Okay, hopefully that's reminded you of the poem. So let's talk a little bit about John Agard briefly then, just because he is a well-known poet. Be ready to make some notes here. Um, a poet and writer. He was born in Guyana. Now it's a Caribbean country that is. It's part of South America. Formerly, its title was British Guyana. It was a British colony as part of the British Empire. He actually moved into Britain in 1977 and has lived here ever since. Um, his poetry, now this is where it's really key to this one as well, his poetry often examines ideas about identity, as we touched upon a minute ago, and also cultures, and looking at sort of what culture is and what makes somebody who they are. He also regularly writes with a light and playful tone. While some of the messages can be very serious, John Agard's poetry, by and large, is actually quite light-hearted, and he also really, uh, does lots of performances of it as well in a very unique style, almost sometimes in a very sing-song type style as well. But either way, that's just worth knowing about him as well. Um, and here we move on then to some bit of context for you as well, just sort of trying to add a bit of uh, add a bit more detail for you. John Agard grew up in what was known as British Guyana, as we said a minute ago. It was a country that was part of the British Empire from the 1700s until 1966. John Agard would have been 17 there, so he was growing up in British Guyana. So it was it was controlled by the British government, yet was still its own country. But he was schooled with a British education system, and it really focused more on white history and overlooked some of the native cultures. There's a lot of references to those. By native cultures, we mean the indigenous populations, the people who were there before the Europeans arrived and took over countries um, like British Guyana, like the Caribbean, like North America. Um, that was sort of a culture which is often overlooked. And he talks about a memory, and I've quoted this from somewhere, from a video he actually does. BBC Bite Size, I'll say that now actually. Very much worth going on to Google. Search for BBC Bite Size Checking Out Me History. And there's two videos on there. One of John Agard reading his poem, and the other is him talking about the writing of the poem. And it's really worth watching. I took this quote from there. Because he talks about this memory of how uh, he read how West Indian history begins in 1492 with the arrival of Christopher Columbus, completely overlooking the history of the people who were there long before Christopher Columbus, but it's almost like it wasn't allowed to begin until the white man arrived. And this isn't a poem about just black and white, but you certainly feel that there's these sort of cultures, this clash of cultures, and very often that is white and black. So, before we get into the poem itself, let's have a quick think about the title, Checking Out Me History. It's written to imitate the Caribbean accent is the first thing you might want to talk about. So it's almost adding an identity to it instantly from the title. Um, it implies, I've said there, that maybe his history has been hidden from him. 
because he's checking out my history, actually looking into it, finding it in some ways. And the word me is really important there as well. Checking out me history is deliberately incorrect grammatically. But again, that's imitating the Caribbean voice, almost finding his own voice and ignoring the rules. And you'll see a bit of that actually when we talk about the form of this poem as well, the way that it's laid out on the page. Um, look at it. I've tried to lay it out side by side, two bits of it actually, because it was too long to fit uh, running downwards. The stanzas are there. There are breaks, there are stanzas, um, but they're irregular. There's no sort of connect direct pattern to them. And it's almost like he's breaking the rules he's been taught. He knows that poetry comes in stanzas, yet he's chosen to sort of do a bit, but also not do a bit. Almost that idea of taking control is a real theme of this poem. Um, there is some rhyme, particularly for the British stanzas, the bits talking about sort of British history, like 1066, Dick Whittington and so forth. Um, but those bits rhyming almost makes them sound a little bit childlike, almost like they're mock he's mocking it. You can see that on like the third stanza, for example, has got dat, cat, um, and then in the fourth stanza, fifth stanza, I think. Anyway, there's, look out for the rhyme where it falls only really for the British ones. Now, I'm going to go through this, be ready to pause. I'm not going to be able to talk about every single line and every single reference, but um, I'll try and do my best for you. So he starts off with, dem tell me, dem tell me, what dem want to tell me. Now I'm going to try not to do too much of an accent here, because it just won't come across well, and I'm not trying to copy John Agard, but there's a real clear sort of Caribbean slant to the way, to the way it's written. Um, Let's move on, though, down to that next little bit there. Bandage up my eye to my own history, blind me to my own identity. Now, there's really strong verbs there. To bandage up is almost to cover up, and to blind is almost to like not allow you to see something. But blind is also a really sort of very uh, aggressive verb as well. If you blind somebody, it sounds very deliberate, and it almost feels like the history is deliberately cut off from him in some ways. And now this is where you get the rhyme. Dem, tell me about 1066. That's the Battle of Hastings in Britain. And all that, like all that, just sounds like it's really unimportant to him. That is a very informal word, even though he spelt it, of course, and said it. Dat, almost having that Caribbean accent. Dem, tell me about Dick Whittington and he cat. But Tucson Liverture, no, dem, never tell me about that. Now, I haven't got loads of time in this video. You really want to look up some of these references. But uh, Tucson was somebody who led slaves to victory. And you see the picture of him there. And he's obviously a real figure, a very proud figure, and again, not taught to him though. And that's what John Agar then goes to explain in the italics. Um, it's almost like he sort of breaks away and is talking about memory, the way it sits to one side and is written in those italics as well. But anyway, we must move on because then he goes on to talk about other things. He got taught about the man who discovered the balloon and the cow that jump over the moon, which is from the nursery rhyme, Hey Diddle Diddle. Yet, uh, Dem, tell me about did dish run away with a spoon, which is the same nursery rhyme, but they never tell me about Nanny de Maroon. Now, that's where another reference as well. Uh, a leader of more runaway slaves is part of Jamaican resistance. So again, a really sort of proud, strong black role model and female as well. And that's what he goes on to talk about there in the italics about Nanny's seafar woman, almost like she has these like visions of hope for the future, and the word hope and freedom come up there. The, the stanza at the bottom of the page here, Dem, tell me about Lord Nelson, he's pictured with the hat there in the middle, uh, and Waterloo, he was a British uh, admiral who led us to victory against Napoleon, and then never tell me about Shaka the Great Zulu, uh, an influential, in, excuse me, a really sort of influential Zulu leader from Africa. The Zulu is an African tribe, quite a famous one as well. Dem, tell me about Columbus in 1492. What happened to the Caribs and the Arawaks too? Um, he never, is what he's sort of asking is, okay, so what happened to the people who were already in place, the Caribs and the Arawaks, who were, whose lands were invaded by Columbus? And in many cases, these were taken by the settlers as well. Those incoming uh, arrivals just took land and were almost brutal to some of the native people. Then tell me about Florence Nightingale and she lamp and how Robin Hood used to camp. Florence Nightingale, famous nurse in the Crimean War, which is the setting actually for Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, so she was a nurse who did lots of good there. Then tell me about how old King Cole was a merry old soul, but then never tell me about Mary C. Cole. And she's pictured at the bottom there. She's also to do with the, um, the Crimean War. Uh, but she was a Jamaican nurse. She asked per, uh, permission from the British to be able to go over and help in the Crimean War because there were lots of injured soldiers and she was refused permission. So then she paid for herself to go over there anyway and did lots of fantastic work like Florence Nightingale. But Mary Seacole is very often overlooked. 
Then we move into the final stanza, the repetition again of dem tell me, dem tell me what dem want to tell me, but now I checking out my own history, I carving out my identity. And carving out almost feels like he's he's making it, finding it for himself, building it for himself, like carving it out of what he's been told already. So that's a real recurring theme there, those figures, and do make sure you make notes and find them for yourselves again but really important influential figures who are often overlooked and that's why I put there hidden or forgotten but more likely overlooked by sort of the white people writing the white version of history and that's the history that he would have studied and many others in this country would have studied as well no matter what your background. Now what I want you to do is pause and have a look at these questions to try and help you annotate your poem. Um, I'm just going to go through them quickly with you, but use these to actually help you make notes on your poem. So don't just like label repetition, but actually the effect of it. So by repeating the dem tell me, dem tell me, just think about what that's emphasising to us. It's making something really clear. So the second one is why might the poet have chosen to use no punctuation? Think about that deliberate rule breaking and why he might want to be deliberately breaking the rules now. Uh, the third one is the reference to blindness. Why does he use reference to blindness? And how does that link to the poet's message? How can you sort of see blindness being mirrored in what he's talking about here? Four is what can you say about the choices of tell? He says them tell me, or not teach me, but tell me. And he's carving. And finally, what I want to do is think about the uh, links to power in this poem, because it sits in the power and conflict cluster. Why? Who has the power is my final question for you there. What I'm going to do is move on, pause this, come back to it, and have a go at those questions, really important questions. What comparisons could you make to other poems? Well, I mean, you've certainly got the idea of identity, which is sort of explored throughout tissue, but generally power. This is a very different sort of sort of power to maybe poems like Remains, where there's a loss of power of the soldier, where his memories are almost making him powerless. And in this poem, you've got the idea of finding your power by finding your own identity. So in some ways, those are very different poems. You could maybe think about lots of other examples where there is power being lost in some poems. And in this one, it almost feels like he's being empowered and trying to go off and find his identity. I've made up this question here for you in the green box. You need to remember that you, when you write about poems, you are comparing as you go. But for the purposes of this video and for revision, I'm simply asking you to actually um, write about this poem on its own. So don't worry about the comparison element yet. I've made up this question similar to the ones you might receive, which are, how does Agard explore the power of identity? Beneath that, I've written what I think you could do next, because it's really important you have a practice at these, so use write your own P-E-A-R paragraph for me. But focus on the repetition of Dem Tell Me. That's the method you could pick out. And also the, the idea of him using Dem rather than them, and the effect of that, how it sort of emphasises and brings through his own identity to us. And then what I've written for you here, which you can pause and read properly in a minute, is my own version of a P-E-A-R paragraph. The underlined parts are the parts that I would encourage you, strongly encourage you to use, in fact. Use them to actually form your own answer. Because by doing so, you will pick up more marks. The first sentence, I've directly answered the question of how does he explore the power of identity? My first sentence, I've said exactly what his identity is and the power the loss of power in many ways. And then in my second sentence, what I've done, which will also gain me marks, is I've picked out a method that the writer has used. He uses the negative imagery in that one. And then following that in the green, that's where I've tried to embed my quotes. So I've chosen the ones about bandaging up and blinding him to his own identity. That's about a third of my answer. The remaining two thirds are actually these two bits of here, the red bit and the purple bit. The red bit is my analysis. So once I've used my evidence, I'm then going to unpick why does he use negative imagery? How does that sort of reveal his identity by using this negative uh, imagery? And I've tried to do that there, and then I've put additionally where I've gone into more detail and tried to unpick it even further. That's very likely to gain me more marks. Say one thing, you'll get a set of marks. Try and push your idea a stage further and then look at it from maybe a different angle, and you're likely to receive more marks from the examiner. Finally, in purple, what I've got going on there then is I'm trying to unpick what is the message of this poem? And those are the sentence starters underlined for you. Like, what does it teach us? What do we learn? Trying to actually reflect on what I'm sort of taking away from this poem, what I'm realising. And in that first sentence in purple, I've talked about like the idea of history maybe not being a full version. Um, and then in my second sentence, I've tried to link it back to identity. That's the key word from the question. So I've tried to drop it into my answer wherever I can. That's me running out of time. All I want to do is say thank you. 
thank you very much for watching this video. Um, I hope you check out the other ones and use them as part of your revision, recapping these poems. Whatever happens when it comes to your exams, I wish you the very best of luck. Make sure you do all your preparation and be prepared, and then uh, you'll do as well as you possibly can. Thanks for watching, everybody, and goodbye.